Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. Um, yeah, I will be talking about uh, CICD pipelines, which uh, have become a very important uh, asset for companies with all the DevOps um, methodology and culture coming in. Um, and of course, CICD pipelines also require security around them. So basically, companies will set it up, will configure it uh, in a secure manner because we need that as we are trusting these pipelines to basically take code and most of the cases automatically drop it in a production environment, of course, after, after some testing, etc. And today I would like to showcase how important it is to take uh, care of this security as very small decisions can have quite a big impact uh, to the point of breaking that trust built around the CAC pipeline, or as I like calling it, uh, poisoning uh, the pipeline. Uh, my name is Asier Rivera Fernandez. I work as a technical expert at PwC, uh, but I grew up in Spain, in the north of Spain, in a small area called Euskal Herria, or the Basque Country in English. Um, that's where I started studying uh, computer sciences. I did my bachelor over there, and then I moved all the way to the other side of uh, Europe, um, in Sweden, where I pursued my master's, and I moved to uh, Belgium, where I did my master's thesis at Kyle Leuven in the DistriNet uh, department. And as a small fact about me, I really like uh, brainstorming and discussing crazy ideas with uh, colleagues. Um, more often than not, they bring to nowhere, but uh, sometimes you have some good ideas here and there, right? So, uh, going back into the topic, um, I started looking into cloud because I'm passionate about it. I really believe that it has brought a lot of uh, security features. Uh, for a lot of companies around the world. And I also uh, have passion for application security and security development. So I decided to uh, take a deep dive. While I was doing this, I started to wonder really uh, how much do we understand uh, cloud services um, when we're actually using them? Do we really see them as building blocks or do we actually uh, look into the properties, connectivity, how they actually are built, because they are not built for us, they are built for everybody to try to fit as many situations as possible. So I did a deep dive, I focused on CICD pipelines in the cloud, and I took AWS as it is the major cloud provider worldwide. Uh, once I got a confident amount of uh, knowledge around it, I decided to do some risk analysis, some threat modeling, and of course my goal was to really identify those uh, properties, uh, and uh, key areas that I needed to really take into account when trying to really tailor the security and build this trust around the CIC pipeline. So I went to AWS and I looked to the code services, which basically are the DevOps related services within AWS. Um, and as part of a, of a generic uh, DevOps pipeline uh, with the phases yeah, very simplified, there are Many of them, every company has their own, but basically it's a source part, um, build phase, test phase, and deploy. So we have the four, uh, sorry, three AWS uh, code services, code commit. Uh, quite simple, it's just a managed kit server. So you have there your repositories with your branches, you name it. Then there is code build, which in a few words, um, manages the build process with the sense of, uh, it will provide you a container that will run uh, whatever you request, the task that is uh, set up. So basically, it's the computational power. Uh, for the test uh, phase, AWS does not per se provide anything. You can plug in some uh, third-party tools, or you can have your own uh, scanners in a VM or something, or you can also use code build again. So the same that you can do some uh, compilation commands, you can also do some unit tests or whatever you want within uh, the code build container. And the last phase, uh, deploy. So you have code deploy. Once more, the name basically links to the phase. And here, uh, what a, uh, code deploy provides is basically it allows you to simply uh, identify the targets for the deployment. And it will start the process and keep the execution running, uh, make sure that everything goes well, and at the end, monitor all that, of course. Um, this all you can uh, basically set up manually. Uh, you could also take care of the communication in between, but because that is uh, really difficult, AWS provides also a code pipeline, which basically will, behind the scenes, use the other ones, uh, and it will take care of a pipeline execution. So it allows you to have different uh, uh, flows with, uh, you can have parallel executions uh, also. 
Um, and it will take care of that execution. It will make sure that it calls the right uh, projects. So it will call code commit or it will call uh, code build, etc., so that they are all running. So basically, it will execute the pipeline uh, with the flow provided and make sure that everything is going fine. Um, and third, there is a code star, which uh, just adds a new layer of abstraction here. Uh, uses code pipeline underneath um, to, for the infrastructure part, for the computational part. And of course, it provides another types of extensions. In this case, a really easy way to configure IDEs uh, to connect to the project and get access to the repo. Uh, you also can put Jira for uh, issue tracking. You can have extra monitoring on top of it. So it's really nice for uh, project level, project management level, and also allows to use other type of uh, user um, access right management, which is based on Teams, which provides the well-known owner, contributor, and viewer um, roles to the full, uh, it brings it to the full AWS IAM um, configuration. Uh, so I would like to give you a bit more of insight, and I will talk to you about two packages, the source package. Uh, this one is basically the zip file version of the repository. So it's created by code commit with code. So it's basically you take the repository, you zip it. But it, and it's used as input for code build most of the times. So it contains source code, media files, whatever you can imagine that will be in the repository, basically. Everything needed to compile and prepare that code into some uh, application bundle at the end, which is basically the artifact package. This is the output of code build. So once the code has been um, uh, compiled or prepared, um, and is used by code deploy, which is basically the application bundle that will end up in an EC2 instance, so installed via a code deploy agent installed there, running in the instance, or it will be, uh, land in a serverless uh, via Lambda or some container image, etc. And basically, it includes the scripts, uh, information about the location of the of the files within this bundle, or even uh, in an ECR, so um, container registry or whatever you need, so that code deployer basically knows uh, how to update the target uh, resource uh, for to the to the latest version of the application. The example in the image is uh, focusing on EC2 instance, and it's just like a, a Java, simple Java application. And then we have uh, two files. The first one is the build aspect file. This one is used by code build. And for those more related to uh, Jenkins' uh, uh, Jenkins pipelines or GitHub Actions, basically um, it's a file that includes the steps, the tasks to be executed within that container, together with some properties, environment variables, secrets, whatever you need. Um, and the container or code build uh, will provide this uh, to the container if it is set up at project level, but it can also be provided as part of the source package. So you can have it a file, a build a spec file in your repository. Code build will find it out and will execute step by step the commands. The second one, uh, the app spec file, is used by code deploy. It's very similar to the previous one, but basically it tells um, code deploy what steps to, to perform in order to uh, take the, the installation of the new application. Um, and in the case of a more microservice, so container or serverless version, it includes where exactly to locate the new container image or source code package and where it actually needs to, to land. Um, and that's both files. So now that we are all experts in CICD pipelines in the cloud, I would like to uh, ask for your input a bit. So I will play a role of a new developer in the company, and I need access rights to actually do my work. And you, the audience, I would like you uh, to be the administrator. So basically, your task is to define, can I or can I not perform certain actions in the pipeline within AWS? Uh, we will have, uh, we will play around uh, CICD pipeline. So two in this case, uh, one via code pipeline and the other one code star. And basically they target an old school VM uh, deployment or lambdas uh, for serverless. And uh, we also will take care of uh, certain guidelines uh, to say so that AWS manages and provides, which are the AWS managed policies. Basically, this policy is a file that contains a list of actions that are allowed or denied. Uh, and AWS creates these policies to help uh, customers to, li to, to link uh, uh, which type of access rights should be provided for different roles. In the table here, uh, you can see the ones related to code build. 
and there are admin, developer, and read-only uh, roles. And I think it's uh, fair to uh, link the developer one to the target that we are looking for, that you are looking for, uh, since I will be a developer. And in the sense of, uh, in the side of CoreStar, as I already mentioned, there are uh, roles being owner, contributor, viewer. I think it's fair to say here that probably I will fall under the contributor one. So let's start. Would you allow me to list builds? This basically provides a list of builds. Uh, these IDs uh, are linked to a unique execution of the code build project. So every time you run a code build project, it will be linked to a unique ID. And can, do you, will you allow me to list these IDs? Basically, I will need these IDs to later on uh, request more information about that specific execution to see whether the status is green or something went wrong. So I would like to ask the people that would like to allow me to do this to put their hands up. Okay, I see quite a few. And those that not, that would not allow me to uh, do this action, I don't see anybody. So if we follow the managed uh, policies, code build developer says yes, why not? And the contributor role says also yes, so why not? Developer should be allowed to do list builds. Second, uh, could you allow me to delete the project? Basically, deletes the build project, so the full configuration, everything goes down. Uh, those that say yes, put your hands up. I see only one hand. That's a brave person over there. And those that say no, don't allow a new joiner. That makes more sense. A lot of hands up. Of course, uh, AWS managed policy for developers says no. And the contributor, also, contributor role also says no. This makes sense because it will make a hole in the pipeline and something could go wrong. Third, will you allow me to start a build? Just start running a new build of the project. Does that say yes? Quite hands, yeah. And those that say no? I see one hand. Uh, if we follow code build developer, uh, role, it says yes. If we say the contributor role, it says yes. What I did was I really understood what all this means because it can be that a star build doesn't just allow me to start running a build. Let me explain. If you go farther in the documentation, you see there are some parameters. In this case, I highlight here artifacts override and build a spec override. And the first one allows me to modify the uh, location of the output artifact. For this build only, so it doesn't really change the generic uh, configuration of the project. So, OK, it doesn't sound that bad. And the second one allows me to uh, provide a new build spec declaration. In other words, this, the first one allows me to define the location for the output artifact. And the second one allows me to run whatever I want in that container. If it doesn't sound scary yet, this could allow a developer to abuse a star build, to exfiltrate data, tamper with the application, and run privileged commands in the deployment server. I think uh, sounds quite bad, in my opinion. So how does this actually work? First, exfiltrate sensitive data. Option one, a developer can define a new output uh, location for the artifact. So it can be like, hey, put it in my S3 bucket. Not the one managed by the company where I don't have access, but just mine, publicly open to write. And code will be like, yeah, why not? Let's do the execution, use the normal um, compilation process, and at the end, I will copy it somewhere else. And it works. At the end, you get a valid application that you could sell in the black market or just do competency to your own company if you want. And there is another option. So uh, this one takes advantage of the by default. Uh, access to the internet that the container is provided because by default it will run in a VPC that has access to the internet. So basically you override the build spec file and you do the compilation and at the end you put some SCP, SFTP, whatever copy over the internet to my server and you have a fresh application that you can use. If you see, think about paid applications, sounds quite cheap. So number two, tamper with the application. Similar approach, you can define which commands to, be, to run in the container. So why wouldn't those commands add some spiciness to the application bundle, some malware, some backdoor functionality? And then you just wait. That uh, application bundle may be sold, uh, may be sold to, to customers, may be installed in your own servers. 
And this is quite similar to that attack that you may all have heard of, which is called solar winds. In that case, they were not using containers. It was a generic uh, server that was always running where they got access, but it's basically the same idea. And number three, run privileged commands in the deployment server. Similar approach once more, it's all the time the same. Build a spec file that define which uh, commands to run in the container, and the container basically prepares the application bundle. If you are using core pipeline, this needs to include this app spec file. So my commands in the build spec file can add commands, modify commands in the app spec file. Once this bundle gets selected for uh, deployment, the EC2 agent, uh, sorry, the code deploy agent installed in the EC2 machine will go and download that bundle. The one that I, on purpose, added some malicious commands, it will read the app spec file and it will execute my arbitrary commands. This is small, um, sorry. This, uh, I am aware that I mentioned privileged commands and if you are wondering, you don't really need a zero day, you don't really need some fancy last second uh, uh, crazy idea of a hacker, you need to use existing functionality, uh, which app spec file provides just a property called run as, you set it as root, and that will elevate the privileges uh, when running your uh, malicious script in the server. So quite simple. There's a small issue here is how do we make sure that our artifact, so the poisoned artifact, gets installed? Is the one selected for deployment, basically. So one approach could be uh, you first, you run your poison build parallel to the legitimate build. The goal is that the legitimate build finishes right before yours, your poison one. So when the poison one finishes, it will overwrite the existing legitimate artifact package. And three, whenever the EC2 agent, sorry, the code deploy agent uh, goes and downloads this artifact package, since yours has overwritten the legitimate one, it will be selected. Um, simple, but when we're talking about code pipeline, these names are randomized. We cannot just, we cannot just say, code build, please uh, go and write it in version 1.1. All these names are randomized completely. Uh, not only the one of the artifact package, but any package in between the steps with uh, code pipeline, they are completely randomized by code pipeline uh, for versioning purposes. So we need to figure out how to actually find the name. Try so look into it. And of course, uh, code pipeline needs to know what is the name of that randomized package. Uh, he crea it created it, and it will take care of managing it. So there's an option via code pipeline called list action executions which would allow to gather the information we're looking for, the name of the randomized package. Of course, I'm aware we were talking about code build for the developer, so it may be that our developer doesn't have uh, these access rights. Um, but this also allowed in the code pipeline read-only policy, another AWS managed policy for read-only role. And our developer most likely wants to see the green lights in the full process of the execution, so it can be that uh, they have these access rights. But in the case that you are not happy with this, there's a second option, using purely code build. You can, uh, code build for sure needs to know where to store that package somewhere at the end of the process. So it will know it also. So we just need, in this case, two actions to collect enough information to find out that uh, randomized name. And these two are also included in those that we followed before, being the developer policy for uh, code build and the code star contributor role. So it could be that our developer, or most likely, it will have option two at least. So how does it actually work in real life? I'd like to show you two um, demos. The first one will be a pipeline using only code pipeline and below. Uh, I manually set this up like a generic flow. Um, as source, I will use code commit. Uh, for the build phase, of course, uh, core build, <laughs> what else? For the other phase where all the unit testing, all the other type of testing will be included, I just put a manual uh, check for simplicity. And then we have code deploy, uh, which will basically take the bundle and target an EC2 instance that I have set up. There's really nothing special about it. And number two for serverless, here I will use CodeStar. I will use a predefined template, so you, I will create it in a second. Uh, just a project like anybody could create using a standard and default AWS setup. 
This one uh, has one phase less. Uh, it's only source, build, and deploy. It uses code commit, code build, and for the deployment, I'm not really sure why, uh, they normally go for CloudFormation instead of using code deploy. And basically, it's a web application that uh, is, uh, whose logic is in Lambda, so it targets a Lambda function. Uh, maybe a bit confusing, but I will start just creating the second one because I will create it live. Uh, so I will just create it and then we jump back to demo one. So I will create just uh, Node.js Lambda web application. I will give a name. And let's create it. This takes a few minutes, that's why I created it right now, but let's keep it there working. And let's go back to the uh, first example, which is the pipeline on the top. Uh, to demonstrate this, um, I will be using a tool that I developed. You can find it in my GitHub. It's free to use under your responsibility. Um, and basically, it's going to uh, simulate or do the, the tasks that a developer will need to do uh, in order to poison a pipeline. The first one being finding the randomized name, starting a parallel poison build, and then basically waiting. So, sounds good. For that, I have two parts. There is a script, which is just a Python script, which basically does those three things. And in, for monitoring purposes, I added an API that basically is a API gateway, so URL. Uh, Lambda that does the read and write on the DynamoDB is basically a table with uh, poison package ID, and then it, it follows with the status of it. And how it works, basically, when the uh, pipeline in the left-hand side is working as normal, so I am building my legitimate um, uh, build process, so my legitimate artifact, uh, the tool is going to be querying. It's going to try to get that randomized name. Once it finds it, it will start a poisoning pipeline, uh, poisoning build. Uh, let's say that the name found was XYZ, so it will artifact override XYZ, and it will do a poison the script build the spec. Once that is done, it will reach out to the API to let know hey, I poisoned a new one, and it will start monitoring as of there. That's basically it. Uh, for the poisoning uh, build, uh, there is no much to worry about this execution because the tool basically does two things. The first one is a post uh, call to the CVPT API for monitoring purposes and also to demonstrate that I could exfiltrate data. The same way I am able to reach out to the API, I could take the secrets, signing certificates, whatever the build process uses. Number two, create a file. These are CVPT was here file and they are created in the container and in the server. In the case, on the, in the case of the container, um, I added in the artifact package, which allows us to demonstrate that I can also tamper with the application the same way. And it also helps to monitor the status in the case that the API doesn't really work or your container is properly filled without access to the internet. And in the server case, I will create in the root directory, which of course requires root uh, privileges and will demonstrate the part of running privilege commands. So I have uh, in the left-hand side is the AWS uh, setup where I have the code pipeline. Pipeline, as I showed, oh, sorry, we have the Hello World pipeline with a source phase using code commit. I have a build phase using code build. Some other phase with a manual approval and deploy, which uses uh, code deploy. This code deploy will call this machine here. There's nothing really interesting about it. Uh, it has some role set up, easy to read only, but it's just a basic uh, machine. There's nothing really special about it. And then I have my developer, which is the ARF-dev. And as you can see, the only access rights it has is code pipeline, list action executions, which would be option one, and star build. There is no uh, boundaries, there is no groups, there's nothing else. And the users, don't worry, I will delete these access keys later, basically are the 37E, which I will be using the Python script. So in Python, I hope it's big enough. I'm basically calling my Python script. I will say target the Hello World pipeline. And I'm providing the uh, access keys that I'm just showing for that developer. Uh, the next uh, information is the URL and a small secret for the API, uh, which is basically created here. Uh, this is just a CloudFormation template, and it's also available in GitHub, so it's really, really easy to set up all the situation. 
and we can run the tool. So the first thing that it's going to do is try to look for, for artifacts. As you can see, it's already saying, oops, uh, code build part didn't work, which makes sense because it doesn't have the code build options, uh, access rights. And then at any given moment, there will be a pipeline execution that releases. At this moment, it will start as normal. Uh, code commit is going to provide the zip files of the source package. This will take a few seconds. Depends a bit on AWS and how much availability they have. That's done. It goes to the build phase. And in a few seconds, in the right hand side, you will see how the tool prints out a bit of information once it finds the randomized name. Sorry, a bit of waiting. It's normally around 20 seconds. If everything goes fine. There it is. It already found the key, which in this case we are talking about 1MH6 something something. It started a new poison build with the artifacts override for that specific artifact and of course our expected uh, poison script and it has notified the API as I mentioned and it's just monitoring mode. So in a few seconds, once that the poison build uh, executes, it will reach out to the CPPT API and we should see there it is. The container already notified, so it's running. So at any given point from the uh, legitimate build finishing until now where our poison build has finished, uh, the next phase uh, can be continued. And now when the deployment happens, what, ha what it's going to do is, as explained before, code deploy is going to grab my bundle instead of the legitimate one. And there it is. As you can see, the server has been poisoned. It, uh, it replied as true. And this is not the version available on GitHub. This does something else. It does not just uh, create files and so. These are the actual access credentials from the EC2 machine. Let me show you. If I copy the same ones into my credentials file for AWS, Oop. I'm missing an I in there. So if I now would just use that profile, which is the one called EC2, and I will get the caller identity. You can see that this is the instance that I showed you before. It's the EC2 read-only role with the instance ID that, and as you can see, which is exactly the same instance as it was the deploy machine. So at this moment, I am the EC2 instance. And if we look into what the developer was able to do, which is my developer profile, if I go do some S3 LS, this is not allowed because, of course, it doesn't have those access rights. But if I go to the EC2 profile, and I get access to all my S3 buckets. So that is the first uh, use case for this stack. There is more. If we connect to the EC2 machine, and I just list the root directory, we can see that the CPPT was here server, which was created two minutes ago when the execution was running, was created as root, owned by root, so root commands can be executed in the deployment server. And that's for uh, example number one. So example number, number two. Here, code is there. I looked into it, and of course, uh, I will just simplify it a bit, and I will only demonstrate tamper with the application. So I will try to modify the Lambda, and here we are not talking about code deploy. So I started looking into how can I do it, and before I really had to hit my head against the wall or something like that, I realized that the code build server, uh, the code build project set up by AWS for us has already enough access rights to go to the Lambda function and modify the code. I don't know why they use CloudFormation. I guess some kind of blue-green type of deployment, keep track of how everything is going. But basically, CodeBuild will be able to go and call uh, that Lambda function. So let me demonstrate this one. 
the left hand side we have the uh, Brucom uh, Code Star project, and as I mentioned before, it has a pipeline. This pipeline ran for the first time a few seconds ago. You can see the source, sorry, the source with code commit, build with code build, and deploy, which has two steps, but basically is using cloud formation. If I go to the application, you can see a nice application, really simple. In five minutes, you have a web app up and running, and you have your nice CACD pipeline, so you can go to a repository, do your changes, and it runs, right? Then I will just set up the uh, developer. It's the same profile as before. I will remove the code pipeline poisoning uh, access, right? So it's fresh. And I will just add it into the team members as contributor. At this moment, I have a contributor developer that has joined my Brucon project. There it is. Now, what does the developer need to do? It's rather simple. We need to build a spec file. In this case, I don't have any tool because it's rather easy to actually execute this. Uh, so I just have the build a spec file, which looks like this. Quite simple. A lot of text, but it's nothing really to worry about. Uh, there is a Lambda function, which is the ARN of the Lambda function that we will be targeting, the deploy one. And you may wonder, how did I find this name? Um, it's by default generated, so the only difference is the Brucon. But even if this will not be the case, uh, the AWS uh, developer profile via the contributor um, contributor role, it already has enough access rights to list Lambda functions, all of them, or at least most of them, and it could be able to find it. So basically, my build a spec file is just set in uh, a target as that Lambda function. With that, uh, this base64 encoded chunk is basically the index HTML, and I have another chunk which is the index JavaScript. After that, I just create a zip file, including those two, and I call AWS Lambda update function, my target function, and this is the new zip file, and I state it as published. So not, don't only update it, but publish it, make it ready. Then I just get the version of this new uh, code, because I need to change the alias. So the way it works, the API will call Lambda, and it goes based on an alias name, which is called Life. So I basically say, for the Lambda function, the Life uh, alias is going to be set to the latest version, so the one I just up uh, uploaded. it, And it's that simple. So at this moment, the developer only needs to uh, run the code build, so code build, start build, project name uh, Brucon, build the spec override, the file that you see on the left hand side. Um, artifacts override, we don't really need artifacts override, we are not trying to exfiltrate those or we don't really go to be a code deploy, so we don't need it. Source, I don't want the sources here for now, I will just go no source. And run. So our poisoning build is running. The nice part of all this is if you go to your uh, code star point of view and you check the pipeline, nothing is happening. You don't see it. You don't have a view on code star to realize there is a code build running. Code build says it succeeded. This is the previous one, nine minutes ago. You actually need to go lower in the abstraction la layers to look for your uh, poison build. As you can see, it's in progress. It takes around a few seconds. Let's refresh it. It should be finished right now. There it is. This succeeded. So as simple as that, an application in production uh, can be quickly changed into whatever that the developer wants as a contributor. So those were both demos. Let's go back to presentation. So with all this information, um, I decided to bring it back with uh, colleagues and put it a bit under stress to see whether actually uh, these are relevant issues uh, for real world. And is exfiltration really an issue, since a developer already can read documentation, can read code, 
a lot of them have access to really sensitive uh, data from the company. And all that is true. Um, but there are cases where especially new joining developers don't have access to the full project. They only have certain libraries or certain uh, branches, etc. And here, CodeBuild needs access to everything. So any library, third party, whatever you're using into the build process will be accessible for that developer or anybody with those access rights, including signing certificates, passwords that you're using to uh, set up the application, any kind of configuration information like private URLs for the internal infrastructure, whatever it is used by CodeBuild is accessible by the developer. Is tampering really an issue, so application tampering, since a developer can already write code and push it into the um, repository, which will eventually go to the pipeline. And this is true, but this is also a known risk. That's why uh, secure SDLC environments should implement uh, security mechanisms against this, like peer code review, so that no one single person can write code that without being reviewed by anybody else ends up in the deployment server. Um, so basically, CoBill allows us to bypass whatever you have set up uh, for as check for that code to be used in your pipeline because it allows to, in a shadowy way, add new code. Third, is that execution really an issue? Since a developer, and here is more uh, one uh, person army situations or really fast uh, DevOps situations, uh, there can be a developer that uh, already has access to the server and can run some administrative commands to install packages or configure certain things. In a quick uh, fix or patch, you never know. And that is true, but in all those cases, this will be a known risk and there will be mitigating uh, um, actions taken, hopefully, uh, where that administrator will have lower rights or to a specific server or to a specific part of the server or only to put some patching, etc. So it will be limited in some way, or you will have some monitoring and auditing, second factor authentication, you name it. But CodeBuild allows to bypass all those and just run root commands on the server. And once it has been breached, uh, good luck for forensic teams to realize that it was code deploy agent, the one actually doing the dirty job. And the last one, these developers are actually our people. We have coffee with them, we work with them, so we trust them, right? And this is true, but uh, I don't believe it would be the first time that some publicly available GitHub repository has the credentials of a developer that sneaked into the public. Um, also, there is always other things to consider, like blackmailing or um, money, so developers being paid for their credentials. And there are other breaches that would allow uh, some malicious actor to gain access to developer access rights. And more often than not, these are not as monitor and control as admin level. So probably they can still uh, be used. So I think they are relevant uh, for the real world. So uh, with all this together, um, I prepared a, a document and I notified AWS. Look, I don't think there is like a zero day in your uh, setup. Of course, it's not really a technical uh, exploit. I'm just using whatever tools you provided me. And I think there may be something that went missing in the moment of doing threat modeling, or this is a really powerful action that you are using quite simply with uh, low level uh, users. So not only that, but the documentation is not really clear about the power that it has. It starts running a build, doesn't say anywhere, be careful. It can be that it allows to poison your pipeline. So I said, uh, we told them, maybe there is an issue there and some redesign or something has to be uh, done. To which AWS said, this runs as expected and is the problem of our customers to decide who has access to StarBuild. And indeed, we can start a full discussion here to, to, with regards to the documentation doesn't say enough, uh, their own managed policies, provide its access rights, whatever we want, but let's focus on solving the issue. So what would I recommend you to do? Go check your pipelines and evaluate again your access rights. First, if you can deny the star build access, just do it. Especially production, pipelines, etc. cancel. And nobody should be allowed to use a star build. Doesn't make sense. Normally, you can, all this process can be actually automated by triggering when new code is pushed to the, to the master uh, branch. 
and that will be automated. Your pipeline will be happy. You will see all your green lights. Nobody needs to touch your pipeline. The more uh, human input you allow, the more chances for something to go wrong. If you still need to allow the start build action because of some kind of weird uh, use case, I have two options. The first one, if you don't require those override parameters, you can always leverage Lambda. You just have a Lambda function that can be triggered by these developers. And the Lambda function will call a star build, but it will never use the override parameters. Just plain star build uh, project X, and it will run it for them. And if you still really, really require these users to do a star build and to use override parameters, I don't recommend it, but rethink your pipeline. Have uh, uh, evaluated and identified the tasks that are security critical, like code signing, secret management, etc. Split those tasks and make sure that the order is correct. The um, sooner you provide user access, will affect more. Uh, will affect the later uh, tasks. For example, if I already provide in step number one, uh, code build project, uh, a user to to perform some actions via star build. And later on in the pipeline, it comes the project that does the code signing. Well, your code signing is bypassed because if in step one, the developer already uh, modified the code, when it gets signed and whatever later on the process, it gets verified, it's too late. So the ordering is important. And then once you have it uh, really properly set it up, uh, just deny access again. As much as you can, uh, it's my recommendation. If you can go for option number one. So uh, I have uh, published uh, some uh, a small document uh, that is available on the link that you can see there. Um, and it has more information. It basically contains everything I learned about uh, code-related services. Uh, it doesn't so much include microservices uh, and CodeStar, but it really provides way more uh, information about how they communicate, what types of properties you actually need to take into account, like roles, uh, and actions, etc. And yeah, it's freely available in the, in the link. So go have a look and let me know what you think, of course. And uh, before I finish, I would like to bring back the question, do we understand cloud services well enough? And I really hope I triggered a bit of concern on your uh, mind. So next time you just think about cloud as building blocks that can be just put together one after the other one you will actually think twice and look a bit more into it, try to understand how they were designed, what they can do, what they cannot, how do they communicate with each other, what type of access rights am I going to allow. It's not a simple job, but just do it because it can lead to really big issues. And more related to this uh, presentation, I really hope that you will not allow me to start build in your production pipeline anymore. So. That's everything from my side. It uh, has been a pleasure to be here, and if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. All right. Any questions? Thanks for uh, raising the issue. Um, I'm just wondering, I myself, I heavily rely on, on open source cloud auditing tools uh, on GitHub. Have you considered to uh, contribute to them to raise awareness? Mm, I haven't done it yet, but indeed it's a good consideration. Um, I try to reach out to OWASP also, for example, uh, to do this. And I'm trying via, uh, of course, presentations and try to make awareness around it. But yeah, it could be a good idea indeed. Hi, uh, no. thanks for the presentation. Um, I'm absolutely, absolutely not well versed into the whole cloud deployment, but would you not argue that most of these problems um, exist because of, um, well, not enough logging, perhaps? Sorry, not enough? Not enough logging, so not enough transparency towards like the people mm. managing uh, stuff that you are, that you are deploying. 
can be, but uh, even if it just if you just take the, the, the initial issues, so the data exfiltration, for example, logging is not going to help you there. The problem is that the action per se is really overpowered in the sense that it completely allows you to redefine whatever the security engineer and, and architect and so define for that build. And it's really arbitrary commands that you can run. So they're logging, you will see the logs, but probably by then it's late for at least the initial part. Um, the part of the command execution, uh, that one could also be stopped somehow if as part of the steps you will have a, a, a check is the, the, the bundle that, that I'm about to deploy is the legitimate one or is there something strange there? But you wouldn't really any time resolve the full issue with, with logging. There is no way that, uh, because in, even if you would log, um, the legitimate one, uh, the overriding one will actually be parallel with just a new execution. And unless you really go and check the full history, you will not see it happening. And if you have a really big infrastructure with a uh, few pipelines, you will get lost uh, in the loggings, I think. And then in practice, is it a weird thing that you see these parallel processes spawn? So that you see them, I mean, mm -hmm. in, in, in my mind, if I see something like that, I would say, yeah. hmm, that's strange. I don't I, see why a, a system cannot, uh, like, give a warning and, and, and yeah. maybe, that's, that's kind of what I mean with logging, not low level, but even okay. on higher level. So monitoring wise, uh, yeah. yeah, you could do some monitoring on it. And one of the uh, important facts here is who is the initiator of these calls? That would be one. Um, by human uh, eye, that would be a bit more difficult because this was a really, really simple pipeline. But in most of them, you have a lot of parallel things going on. So you have like a list of seven uh, code build executions happening at the same time. If that already covers the seven that the table shows you by default, I don't know exactly the numbers, seven. If you are doing the, the eighth one, you may actually skip it. So you could have some uh, type of monitoring. You would need to do it yourself, of course. Uh, but probably would take something to be running constantly and checking on all the code build uh, pipeline, uh, code build executions, and I think it will be quite costly, to be honest, but to do it with, with that approach. Um, we did send some recommendations to AWS of how we saw it, um, and the simplest solution, in my opinion, is to have a star build with, like, for administrator or, like, for high level, which allows you to do this overrides with like has a big warning label saying be careful with this one and have like a more basic one for developers to just run some test units or uh, things like this but uh, yeah it could be something to look into but I think it would consume a lot of resources yeah okay thanks for your insights okay. thank you Asif. thank you thanks for your time thanks, all. thanks everyone